Hey there, it's Gary Parish. It's Wednesday, December 8, 2021. Welcome back to the CBS Sports I Own College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, dodo birds, and leaky black. Matt Norlander is here with me. He's at home in Connecticut. You can recognize it if you're watching on YouTube. That's his home. I'm still in Harrisonburg, Virginia, where last night, while on the sideline for CBS Sports Network, I got to witness an upset, followed by a court storm. Final, James Madison, 52, Virginia, 49. The Dukes are now 1-11 all-time against Virginia, 1-19 since 1980 against ACC opponents. Dead lag, what'd you make of the scene and the development inside the Atlantic Union Bank Center where a record-setting, sold-out crowd witnessed history? It was history. First win for the program ever over uh, Virginia. It's actually James Madison's only win over a sitting current ACC member as well. Uh, Big time win for the Dukes, who might well be the CAA's best team this season. I'll circle back to that in just a little bit here. I did watch the entire game. Uh, Was a little concerned for your well-being. In fact, I believe Nada has uh, has logged in a poll if you're watching on YouTube. And hello to everyone who's in here early. Yes. Are anyone watching live? We went 30 minutes earlier than we told you we would on the Sunday edition. I, I underestimated how far Harrisonburg is from the Charlottesville airport. Turns out it's like an hour. I've got about an hour Uber ahead of me. As soon as we're done here, I'll be in an Uber for an hour if you need me. Yeah, he uh, Paris hit Nada and I up and said, listen, we got to start this thing at 930. I'm an hour from the airport. I didn't ask questions. I was just like, all right, whatever. We're good to go. So anyone that was on their game had the alerts set up and is subscribed in the YouTube channel. We appreciate you. If you're listening traditionally on podcasts, we, of course, love you quite much. And you're just getting this as you normally would and listening at some point on Wednesday, Thursday or perhaps tardy on Friday. Hello. Hello. So um, big time win for the program there for Virginia. It's now uh, it's now a six and fourteen, but I was concerned. I, I was conf- concerned for your well being because mm. they get the huge win. I'll play some sound from Tony Bennett in a minute here, but I know how these things go. You know, you're working sideline, you get a big upset like this. It's good television. You want to get an interview after the game. Usually, with the head coach, they flooded the floor with a purpose and an intensity, and great on the uh, on the JMU student body. But did you get did you get caught up in that? Like, give us a little bit of the uh, of the blow by blow there, because it and I want to say it took seven minutes to get to you to throw it to you to do the interview after the game, which is understandable because it was a, a mass of humanity down there. It was a mess. Um, so I was down. They have student sections on both ends of the court, uh, both baselines. So There's one student section on one side, one end, one on the other, and it was very clear they were about to storm the court if they won. The game was still undecided in the final minute, but then it became um, a, a, a three-point game with James Madison shooting free throws, and it was pretty clear they're going to win the game, although Virginia did have a shot at the buzzer to send it to overtime. So, it's obvious the students are going to storm from both ends. And so um, I'm, uh, you know, I'm under orders uh, from our producer. Hey, listen, um, we're going to enjoy the scene. We're going to let it, let it play out and then let them celebrate. And then you're going to grab a coach, you know, coach uh, Mark Byington or a, a player. Got it. No problem. So I sort of sit back while the student storm, like, okay, I'll stand over here and let them all flood it. I'll let everybody celebrate and then I'll grab somebody and it'll be good to go. And you have to understand because of COVID protocols, this isn't as simple as, Hey, you've got a camera following you and, and you just grab somebody and then interview them. I have to grab somebody and then take them to a camera where a headset is waiting for them so they can put on a headset and I can have my ears in and we'll be socially distanced while doing this post-game interview. So it's it's complicated to begin with, much more complicated when the court is stormed. Here's the thing that I didn't properly anticipate. Once I was, quote, letting them celebrate, the entire court is filled with people. I have no idea where Mark Byington is, where any player is. I can't see. I don't know if you know this. I'm short. So I can't see anybody. Probably. And so I, it's a, it's a real problem. And so I'm, uh, uh, you know, we're letting the scene play out. It's fine. But it becomes a time where, all right, 
it's time to do the post game interview. And I'm like literally, you know, on, you know, in communication with uh, our, our producer. And I'm like, I can't, I don't, I can't, not only do I not have Mark Byington, I can't see him. I don't know where he's at. I can't see anybody. And so I am really scrambling through the crowd. And then of course you have to understand it's a, uh, it's it's a bunch of students seeing the guy carrying around the CBS mic. So it's like, you want to interview me? You want to interview me? You know, and it's like you're you're respectfully turning down interviews while you're looking for anybody to actually interview. The whole thing's crazy. While you're looking and you're short, sure everyone's wearing the same color. So it doesn't make it that much easier. You just, just give me someone in a uniform, please. Someone that logs significant minutes. Oh, OK. So like I'm not exaggerating for multiple minutes. Not only did I not see. Um, see Mark Byington. I, I couldn't see anybody. I never saw a player. I never saw a co- nobody. I couldn't see anybody. And I couldn't get to anybody. I didn't even know. It wasn't like, can I get to them? It was like, I don't even know where to go to get to them. I don't know where they are anymore. It, it, the whole court storm. So then, thank God, I see Votto Morris, who was a significant player in the game. I just happened to bump into him. And I'm like, it was like finding a lottery <laughs> ticket. I was like, please, come, come with me. Because now it's not like I got a camera following me. I got to now escort him to my camera, which I know is on one end of the court. But we have to get through a million people. So good luck with that. Then we get to the end of the court. Now guess what I can't see? My cameraman. Have no idea where he is. They say he's on the baseline where you did your opening shot. I, I, I'm i on the baseline where I did the opening shot. Where He's short. He's a short guy, too. I can't see him. So we finally we finally got it done, but uh, it was it was a mess, a, a good kind of mess, because um, that was an awesome awesome scene. Couldn't be happier for Mark. Couldn't be happier for those players, those students, the faculty, everybody who was there. It was a sold out, record setting crowd. I mean, the environment was awesome. Like I'm not sitting here and trying to tell you that the um, I- Atlantic Union Bank Center is Cameron Indoor or Allen Fieldhouse. But it was as loud as you could get in a basketball arena uh, last night. And it made for uh, just an incredible scene and a memory. You know, the people in there last night will remember that forever. Like I had somebody, you know, because I tweeted the the court storming uh, video and somebody was like, oh, storming the court against a six and four team. I was like, if you're framing it like that, you just don't get it. And it's, it's not, that's not a six and 14. That's that's Virginia. That's Tony Bennett. That's the 2019 national champions. That's an ACC opponent you've literally never beaten. They they were nice enough to come to your arena, something they don't have to do, and and then you upset them. It's um that's a that's a that is something that'll be in the James Madison media guide forever, if they still do media guides. That is something that uh, that the people in that building and the players and that coaching staff. It's something they'll remember forever. It was a cool scene. This game was originally scheduled for a season ago, and there are no shortages of instances in men's college basketball where games that were scheduled in the non-conference for last season wind up wind up just getting canceled altogether because of COVID logistics and going forward. Virginia could have done that. Tony Bennett insisted on not doing that. He wanted to help JMU quote unquote open up the building, although you know this is not the first game in there, but with a with a big time opponent, in-state opponent. Here is what Bennett said. It's about 46 seconds long. Here's what he said afterward, uh, after the loss to the to the media assembled in the press room. The fans were great, minus a few of them, some of the things I heard, but that's all part of it. Uh, um, and Mark's done a really good job. This is a good team. Um, he, he's built it. And, and I want to compliment, you know, this. I, I came from Green Bay, a mid-major, whatever you say, and there's so much parity. And I always hope that, you know, we get to play some of the power fives, and that's irrelevant. And I never got to, and I, I learned from my father when he took the Wisconsin job, he'd go play green. Uh, they'd play green Bay, Milwaukee, those schools. Well, I think that's important. A lot of teams won't come in here and play it. That's their philosophy. This is a good team. This is a good college basketball, history, beautiful building and a tough environment, but good for our guys. So I, I, uh, I, it's things to lose. Um, but our guys battled in the second half. So uh, a good point from Tony there to be fair. It's not like Virginia plays on the road in, you know, in state every single season. He's done it a handful of times, but 
you know, you, you heard Kevin Willard say this earlier this season. We've talked about it a couple times on the podcast. And I do think because of increased discussion on podcasts like this, coverage across the sport, coaches are now more aware of this. They're talking about it more. I don't know if we'll look up in three years and it will be different. But I do know that at least among coaches that have job security, they are more willing to do this. You know, I think Virginia's played a couple of times at VCU over the over the years under Tony. And it's he hasn't done it every single season. I don't know if he will do it every single season, but he did it here. He understood how important it was for James Madison. And, you know, yeah, Virginia fans this morning, they're pissed because they got a team that might not make they've got a program that might miss the NCAA tournament for the first time since I got into my notes here, 2012-13. They were 21 and 11 that season. They went 10 and three in the non-league. Virginia's almost certainly going to win its final non-conference game uh, to get to seven and four against uh, Fairleigh Dickinson. But, you know, so if you're a Virginia fan right now and here and now, I understand why you're frustrated, but I did like hearing that from, from Bennett. And I would hope that, you know, he would, he would kind of back up that spirit going forward next season, the season after whether, you know, JMU or, or any other, um, maybe school in the in the Commonwealth, if you will, being willing to go and play them. Because, yes, it did create an amazing scene. Yes, it's a tough spot to to win at. But JMU is also a, a legitimate opponent. And it wasn't a stunner that JMU won this game to me. We talked about it. I think I joked with you on the Sunday Night Podcast. But it was, uh, it was, a, it was a quality win. Um, real quick, JMU held Virginia to 14 first-half points. This was set on the broadcast. It was the lowest points and a half ever first or second half under tony bennett period um it was just it was you know it was problematic and jmu by the way won this game oh what 52 49 they didn't have a single player hit double digits <laughs> it's the first time uh that jmu has played a game and not had a player score at least one at least 10 points since a loss to ohio state in 2009 so credit to jmu for the win it is troubling for virginia i think we can really start to ask is, is this team going to make the NCAA tournament? That's now on the table there because of the issues with the ACC. I mean, that conference has non-league losses to, you know, Pitts bad. Um, Louisville lost to Furman. Virginia also has a loss to, to Navy on its on its docket there. Um, Syracuse, which lost, we'll get to them in a second. It's lost to Colgate. Virginia Tech didn't beat Memphis. Like, they lost big opportunities there. There's another one that's in there that's bad. Um I can't remember, but there's there's been plenty of issues with the league being down. So if you're a Virginia fan and you're kind of gripping a little bit here on Wednesday morning, it, it's completely reasonable. Uh, the fans, Tony was referencing, started a "fu Tony" chant in the final minutes. What which, are we doing? Like he was arguing a call, and their response you was, "You can do it, yeah, Paris. You can do what you want to do, but right. Like if, the, you want, if you want Virginia and other teams to come play you, like you know, well, well that, 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 that's, that's that, yeah, right, like." It, it, Two old guys telling students how to behave is not like we're, we're accomplishing nothing. But um, if you take a step back, like Tony Bennett is a blessing to James Madison. He brought the 2019 national champions to your arena and created a sellout crowd and a memory forever. It should have been thank you, Tony, not F you, Tony, but whatever. Students are going to be students. It's not it's not a big deal. Even Tony seemed to recognize it's not that big of a deal. Um you mentioned they only scored 14 points in the first half. It was almost 11. I know. Because <laughs> they missed Paris. Maybe you know off the top of your head. Did I think UVA missed its first 10 three-point attempts or something like that. They just couldn't. They couldn't. Yeah, they were one of 11. Um, no, one of 14. It, one of 14 in the first half from three. So Virginia was up 10-2 to start the game. That's the other thing. It was 10-2 seven minutes into the game. And then they're down 24-14 at the half. Uh, James Madison outscored them. 22 to four in the final 1243 of the first half. Virginia had one field goal, one, and that was the three pointer that made it uh, 14 points instead of 11. Um, they had one field goal in the final 1243 of the first half, one of 14 from three. So I, the way that works at halftime is um, usually you talk to the winning coach on camera, the, the head coach, the coach whose team's ahead on camera, walking off the court, and then you get the other coach af you know, after he leaves the locker room, coming back to the court, and then you do an on-camera report uh, just before the second half tips off. Um, for this one, um, we, I just talked to both coaches off camera and then did a report just before the second half started. So I talked to Mark, um, and I talked to Tony, and Tony was great. I mean, obviously frustrated. 
but just great. Like he's a genuinely nice man. <laughs> and so um, not all coaches would be sm- Hey, good to see you. <laughs> you know, they're down 24, 14 at the half at James Madison. Tony's great. And um, he was like, listen, we're just putting, we're putting too much pressure on our defense. Like we have to make a shot. We have to score. Uh, we can't, we, you know, we held them to 24 points and we're down double digits. That's a problem. Uh, I'm paraphrasing here. That's more or less what he said. And I, and I, I said, uh, I said, well, listen, you're not, you're not gonna, cause we're off camera. So we're just sort of talking like two people who've known each other for a while. And I said, uh, well, you're not going to go one of 14 from three again in the second half. And I swear he, he goes like this as if to say, I, I sure hope not, <laughs> you know, but I don't know. We might, <laughs> you know, we might. And they didn't, but they did end up, um, Four of 26 from three in the game. They only took 50 shots in the game, and 26 of them were from three. Now, usually about one out of every three shots Virginia takes is going to come from three. That's what the numbers show. Against James Madison, it was 52%. 52% of their field goal attempts came from three, like they're Alabama or something, like they're Villanova. They, they, they They don't normally shoot the ball from three like that, but some of it, and Mark Byington had told me this at halftime, like we we're, we're, we want to play them tight and like we want them to keep shooting threes. Um, like it, it seemed to be, it wasn't just Virginia was launching for three as much as James Madison was trying to take away everything but the three. Um, it's a little bit like the opposite. Iona and Alabama have played you know, like twice this calendar year, once in the NCAA tournament, then, you know, um, down in Orlando, I guess, earlier this season. And both times, uh, Alabama shot the least amount of three-pointers that they've taken, like, you know, in the past two years. That's not an accident. That's I. That's Rick Patino deciding we're going to take that away and let you get other shots. Last night, James Madison seemed to try to take away other shots to let Virginia launch from three, and the result was not good. Again, they were four of 26 from three. And so now Virginia's six and four with three losses to unranked teams, lost to Navy, Iowa, James Madison, got blasted by number 14, Houston. You know, they've won at least a share of five of the past eight ACC regular season titles. They were picked fourth in the preseason AP, uh, ACC poll. Trivia time. Oh, boy. Tony Bennett is in his 14th season at Virginia which means he's completed, see if you can follow me here, 13 seasons at Virginia. How many times have the Cavaliers either matched or exceeded where they were projected to finish in the ACC in the preseason? The maximum... You spent a half hour researching this last night? No, it was in the Virginia notes. Oh, there we go. Shouts to Eric Bacher, uh, SID there. Who's also great, by the way. Yes. Um, fellow bald man like myself. He is a fellow bald man. Uh, Master exceeded. So the maximum will be 13. I'll say, 12 out of, I'll say 12 out of 13. If it's 13 out of 13, that's bonkers. Dead leg. You're exactly right. It's 12 out of 13. 12 out of 13 years, Virginia has either matched or exceeded their preseason projection in the ACC. Trivia time bonus. Oh, boy. What year? Did they not? Um, last season. No, they did last season. They were fine last season. Only exception, 2017, they finished tied for fifth in the ACC after being picked third. I bring all this up to tell you, I'm not sure they're going to be able to do it this season. They were projected fourth in the ACC. Are they going to finish top four in the ACC? Uh, I doubt it. I, I doubt it. Well, I think not to put up a poll in, in the YouTube live chat here. Right now, let's predict it. Virginia going to make the NCAA tournament in 2022, yes or no? I would say no. I would say no as well. I don't think they're going. Yeah, yeah. right now, um, they're, they're, we need to come up exactly how you um, say this so we can have a, a common ground here. Now that I've learned how to take all the preseason data out of Torvik, <laughs> oh, boy. It's opened up a whole new world for you. Oh, boy, was that a turning point for GP. So how do you describe that? Because they're not, they're, Virginia is now 93rd at Torvik if you eliminate preseason data. Is that the way you say it? Preseason bias, yeah. If you eliminate the preseason bias, I wish you could eliminate your, your East Coast bias, dead leg. 
I have no East Coast bias over here whatsoever. By the way, you said 93. They're 92 in the net. They dropped from 78 to 92. James Madison got up to like the 150s or whatever. So, you know, go ahead. Yeah, they're 56 at Ken Palm. You know, Ken Palm currently projects uh, Virginia to finish seventh in the ACC with a 10 and 10 record. It looks like an NIT team. And if you're trying to figure out why this is, it's not because Tony Bennett's forgotten how to be awesome. Um, the only reason we're even talking about can they make the NCAA tournament is because of their coach. He doesn't have the players. We talked about this in the preseason. Like, you can go find our ACC preview in the preseason where I said, you know, I, I, I guess I'm, I, I'm going to believe that Virginia is going to be good. But if you look at the roster, there's no reason to think they're going to be good. Like, if you give that roster to any other, co- basically any other coach in America, you don't even think about ranking them in the preseason. But Virginia was preseason top 25, um, at least top 25 and one, I believe, in the AP poll as well. And it was just based on what's well, Tony Bennett. He'll he'll figure it out. But I don't think in the preseason, I didn't think they had the players. And after watching last night, I just don't think they have the players. Like they get to a point on offense where they just need Kihei Clark to score. And that is not a recipe for success. Like they even take him off the ball and run him off screens because they need they need somebody to try to make shots and he's best equipped to do it. But if he's best equipped to do it, you don't have a great roster. Like that 2019 championship team had five players who went on to play in the NBA. Two NBA guards. I don't think there's an NBA player on this Virginia roster anywhere. And so that's how you start a season six and four with three losses to unranked teams. You know what the good news is? You did not have to watch Texas Tech versus Tennessee. (laughs) Texas Tech uh, beat Tennessee on Tuesday night in overtime in what I gather was a very ugly game. Villanova then beat Syracuse. We'll get into the Jimmy V Classic next. But first, check this out. So Texas Tech beat Tennessee on Tuesday night, then Villanova beat Syracuse. They call it the Jimmy V Classic. Dead leg, while I was at James Madison surviving a court storm, I know you were keeping track of it. What did I miss beyond a lot of missed shots? I mean, do we have to talk about this game? Maybe we do because it was so horrendous. I had I had said it might be one of the most unwatchable games between two power conference teams I've ever seen. And I got a little little love like didn't Arizona State barely score like 28 points, 29 points last week on the Pac-12 network? Yes, but that was bizarrely compelling because it felt it felt almost historic and uh, and how anemic Arizona State was. This was like both teams just couldn't hit anything. It was just clank after clank after clank. This was even worse here. You had 54 missed three point attempts between these teams. 24 turnovers, bad foul shooting. <laughs> it got so bad that at one point, jo- Josiah Jordan James, he got snipered on a breakaway layup attempt. <laughs> now, I did see this. I- which it looked, this looked so ridiculous to the point where it convinced me we are living in a simulation and someone simply was just tapping a button to make sure James was induced as though he was a toy that lost his batteries. It was absurd. And then on the other end, I can't remember who, maybe it was McCuller. I don't know. Couldn't convert a dunk attempt. It it just, it reached and that it just reached the point of absurdity GP. So yes, a hilariously terribly poorly played game that Texas tech won. Tennessee shot 26.8% from the field. Thanks in part to that. I did see the breakaway miss dunk. Like, missed, like, like, what is it? For like seven seconds, you're like, please tell me he didn't just blow an ACL. And he didn't. He's fine, thankfully. And so with all that, you can then say, what the hell? <laughs> like, no, I was, I was like, please tell me he's not dead. Did he just die in transition? Be a hell of a way to die in transition. <sighs> Most people bad. don't die in transition. <laughs> it was bad. He's By a, the way, funny uh, upshot of all this, Tennessee lost. Texas Tech, well, it won in 57-50 overtime. It wasn't that much better. 
Tech averaged 0.73 points per possession. Tennessee was down at 0.67. Just horrendous. But because Texas Tech was so terrible, and I'll give a little bit of credit to Tennessee's defense, Tennessee is now the number one rated defensive team at Kempom per possession. <laughs> so terrible loss, 6-2. and two, You take an L. Don't look top 25 worthy. But you have you now, by nature of that game, you, as of this morning, as we speak, Tennessee has the number one defense in America. Yeah, I spent the top 25 and one on Tuesday morning uh, writing about Kennedy Chandler's terrific start to the season. Then he goes 4 of 13 from the field, 1 of 5 from 3, 0 of 1 from the free throw line. He didn't miss a free throw in his first six games. He's now 0 of 3 from the line in the past two games. On the other side, Texas Tech. Now 7-1. Got to win over Tennessee. Lone losses to a Providence team. Makes sense of all this. Texas Tech 7-1. Lone loss to a Providence team that lost to the Virginia team that lost to Navy and James Madison. Enigma wrapped in a riddle. Covered in a mystery. What do you want from me? Uh, I got to figure out what to do with Texas Tech. Did you? Do you have them? You must have Texas Tech, right? Yeah, I felt like I had to. Um, Texas Tech, I put it 19. I dropped Tennessee down to 20. One spot ahead of the North Carolina team that Tennessee already beat, which is sitting at 21. There's no great way to handle all this. Like, you know, like, uh, they, yeah, I mean, but they do all have strong computer numbers. North Carolina, not so much, but Texas Tech and Tennessee have strong computer numbers. Texas Tech was the one in um, the preseason that had really strong computer numbers that people weren't really ranking in human polls or human rankings. Um, you know, and I don't, I don't know how good they'll be, but, um, you know, they just beat Tennessee on a neutral. And Tennessee was a one loss team before that. So it goes 19 Texas Tech, 20 Tennessee, 21 North Carolina. Good win for Texas Tech. It has one more uh, solid non conference opportunity forthcoming. There's another one midseason SEC Big 12 challenge against Mississippi State, but we got to wait till the end of January for that one. They Texas Tech will play against Gonzaga. I believe that game is in Phoenix. That is next saturday we'll preview that game when the time comes the other game was syracuse versus villanova when that when the texas tech tennessee game went to overtime you had <laughs> orange and wildcat fans in in the building and then they're just booing the hell out of these teams which is which was incredible by the way every single shot of a syracuse fan in that game on on tuesday night they were like yeah many of them were double fisting all just you know just liquored up and loving it i thought that was a, a pretty good scene there villanova gets the win uh 50 missed three-pointers. We didn't Sorry. miss 50. They took 50. Took 50. Sorry. They took 50, missed 37, and they win by 14. How'd you like to be on the other side of that? You see another team miss 37 threes against you, and you lose by 14 points? That's that's really rough, GP. It was close for most. Villanova kind of won it down the stretch. I You would have been back to your hotel by this time. Did yeah. you tune in and see the second half at least? Yeah, I watched, I watched Villanova-Syracuse. Um... And that, that's the difference in, in where those programs are right now. That Villanova can miss 37 threes and still beat Syracuse by double digits. Um, you know, Villanova became, I saw this ESPN stats and info, just the fifth major conference team in the past 25 years to launch 53s in a game. Um, and they didn't even need to make a good percentage to beat Syracuse by double digits. Now, the score a little misleading because, like you said, it was close most of the game. They just sort of separated at the end. But either way, the result is the result. And now Syracuse is is just five and four. Um, you know, they finished sixth or worse in the eight. You know, they got a final four in there and a sweet 16 in there. So it's sort of um it's a little misleading. They finished sixth or worse in the ACC in seven straight seasons. No one is surprised. <laughs> it's, just, it's just what they do. And I know, but they like that's not. That's not the Syracuse I grew up with. It's not the Syracuse I grew up with. Here's my, I thought about this last night when you're, because you, when you're mentioning this stuff, I thought, and to any Syracuse fans watching in real time, if you're in the chat, you can feel free to chime in. But if you're a Syracuse fan right now, like, do you want, do you want Jim Beheim or the field coaching your program next season? You know, Beheim 77, uh, program legend one of the best coaches in college basketball history maybe you do I'm, I'm not saying one way or the other i'm just i'm kind of genuinely intrigued about the average syracuse fan what are you are you satisfied with the state of your program are you happy with the way that it's going it feels like whenever Beheim does retire if that's next season or in 17 years uh it will be a situation similar to duke where someone on staff 
will wind up taking that job. So keep that in mind as I kind of post the question. But are you ready to move on from this? Or would you still prefer, even for a little while longer, another couple of seasons? No, let's keep Beheim you know, on the sideline. I'm just, I'm just curious. I, I don't necessarily have the answer, but it did. It flickered in my mind at, when that game was ending. And I wanted to bring up on the podcast. Uh, if you've got thoughts, by the way, you can, and you're a Q's fan, you can always leave them in an Apple review, but I don't know. I don't know what the right answer for that is, but to your point, um, they've had success here and there in the NCAA tournament, but they have not been a top shelf team in the ACC. And there's no indication that that, you know, that's going to return anytime soon. No, I mean, seven straight seasons of finishing sixth or worse in the ACC. Like, seven years? That's a long, that's a, like, a, that's an entire coaching career for some people. That's a long time to not be competing um, at the top of your league. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier, Virginia's won at least a share of five of the past eight ACC titles. And Syracuse has finished sixth or worse in the same league in seven straight seasons. And now they're currently projected at Kempom to go 17 and 14 overall, 11 and nine in the ACC. And I think what does complicate it is like they're, they're not good with Jim's kids taking all the shots. Like that's a, you know, I, yeah. it's not great. It's not great. It's not a great situation. Buddy wasn't good last night. Um, Jimmy, not Jim, but Jimmy was actually better. Jimmy had 21. Buddy was at six points on three of 18 shooting Ugh, can't have that but yeah i know that's also another another element to everything that's going on there one more interesting result from the past couple of nights texas southern mm -hmm. 69 florida 54 so the sec had more teams ranked in the ap poll on monday afternoon than any other conference the league was celebrating you get two teams in the college football playoff now you got more men's basketball teams ranked than anybody else and i got a text from somebody on monday night because i had like real travel issues i was late leaving memphis flight delayed i got stuck in atlanta monday night i had to spend the night in atlanta at the airport you not like it. i mean i didn't stay in the airport i left the airport got a nice hotel room but like still you don't want to get stuck somewhere i was stuck so Every anything that was happening was off my radar, but like I didn't think there was anything that needed to be on my radar. There were no good games Monday night, or no relevant, no games that were that I believed would impact the top twenty-five and one. And then I get a text from somebody, and they're like, "Have you seen this Texas Southern thing?" And I'm like, "I, I yeah, I don't even know what they're talking about. I didn't even know Texas Southern is not something I keep close tabs on." My apologies to Johnny Jones. And not only did they beat Florida. In the O-Dome, but they blew them out. Texas Southern was 0-7 and, and ranked 224th at Ken Palm before the game. They were 23.5 point underdogs. They go to the O-Dome, win the game by 15. What? Two things. I mean, you're going to just blow by. Michigan walked into Pinnacle on Tuesday. You missed that, by the way. They I walked missed in. that. I saw, I saw Fred Horbert. They walked in. Michigan walked in to Pinnacle Bank. They did walk in. It's tough. It used to be tough. It used to be tough. Again, maybe the, maybe the Atlantic action. Bank Union Center is the new Pinnacle. You know, let's yeah, live and, in, and well, my well, let's live in well. the present. And then that's used, quite a mouthful of an arena name, by the way. I can't tell yeah. you how many times I had to look up. I can't tell you how many times I've you googled. Should have, you, you should have called it the Big Bank. We both know this. You should just should have <laughs> called it the Big Bank. I can't tell you how many times I had to Google James Madison Basketball Arena over the past two days. It's the Atlantic Union Bank Center, otherwise known as the Big Bank. As the Big Bank Challenge. There we go. Maybe it's the new Pinnacle. It might be. So Michigan walked into Pinnacle um, and used to not be able to just walk into the O Dome. Couldn't, couldn't do it. Not when I was not when I was young. You couldn't do it. And now Texas Southern went 63 to 45. The extremely rare hmm. double seed line swing. Oh, no. I think this is so significant that Texas Southern, you know, you'll often see at, at least one of the HBCUs that 
get into the NCAA tournament, get into the first four, and they make it a, a, a point not to put both in. This this win will be so good that if Texas Southern can win the SWAC, it's not it's not going to Dayton. If it can get into the tournament with an auto bid, it's not going to Dayton. It's getting that it's getting that bump. And if Florida can make the NCAA tournament, this is worth at least two seed lines. This is. I bet if I had Jerry Palm on right now, he would disagree with you. I don't care what Jerry Palm says. I oh, make wow. When it comes to the double seed line swing. This wow. If, if Florida's schedule plays out and they wind up getting, say, an eight seed and you take off the, te- the Texas Southern loss, I'm going to say they'd otherwise be a six. This is going to be the worst loss. I think it will be the worst loss of any team from a power conference that makes the NCAA tournament as an at-large, if indeed Florida can make the tournament as an at-large. It is a horrendous quad four loss that is going to stink up this resume for the rest of the season there, and you just you just can't have it. I mean, what are we doing here? I, I don't know if it was just a situation with the Gators where, you know, they, I don't know, they, they come off a loss to Oklahoma, which, by the way, lost to Butler on Tuesday night in overtime, a really necessary win for the Bulldogs in that game. Um, credit to Chuck Harris, who had 26 points. That was a nice win for Laval Jordan and that team. And I know that fan base was like aching for any kind of relevant win. So good on Butler. But Florida lost to Oklahoma, turns around. I, I almost thought like half the team must be sick. But credit to Texas Southern for getting the win the way that it did. And you know, just, uh, no doubt about it. You know, it, UMB seed Florida, so to speak. And so, yeah, that was definitely a notable result uh, from Monday. As we speak here and record Wednesday morning, Florida's turning around on a two day um two day swing and it hosts the two and eight North Florida trivia time. Mm. They're cheating. What's North Florida's mascot? North Florida's mascot? Your eyes just went really wide. Oh, North there's Florida's the, mascot. What do we got? The North Florida Gales. Gales? It's a I bird. Oh, Trivia's yeah. The, time in real time for people. The North Florida. Penguins. Penguins. Yes. North Florida Penguins. There's only one penguin in D1. Who are the penguins in D1? Bo- bonus trivia time. Side trivia time. The only penguins in D1 are the UMass Lowell Penguins. Man. Youngstown State. Or Youngstown the Young- State is penguins. North Florida. It's a bad bird, I'm telling you right now. The Ospreys. You ever come face to face? Oh, of course the Ospreys. No, I've never come face to face with the Osprey. Why would why would I ever get face to face? You wouldn't survive to tell the tale. Why would I get face to face with an Osprey? You think I'm trying to French kiss an Osprey? <laughs> I didn't say mouth to beak. I said face to face. You think I'm trying to suck face with an Osprey in a way I, that could lead to premarital sex with a bird? I'm not. Oh man. It's not my thing. That's not my th- I got my things, but that ain't my thing. I got my things, but that ain't my thing. Everybody's got their things, but sucking face with an Osprey's not mine. Florida six and two can get right against the Ospreys Wednesday, and then it's got to play the Danny Manning coached Terrapins of Maryland, which, by the way, we didn't mention this on the other pod, lost their first game with Manning on the sideline on Sunday against Northwestern. That was a home loss, so we'll see if Florida can get right there. But yeah, that was. Damaging loss for Florida. Can't that's that's a that's a that's a stinker, and it, it it practically offsets the win over Ohio State. It's it's that bad. I don't care what Jerry Palm says. Is that a direct quote? Is that a pull quote? I don't care what Jerry Palm says about the double seed line swing. That's the full quote. Jerry Palm is CBS Sports bracketologist. You're sitting over here talking about his bracket, and then and I'm then, not talking about his bracket at all. There's no bracket to talk about. I'm talking about a double seed line swing situation going down at the O Dome. You lose at home to Quad Four competition. Where is where is where is Texas Southern right now in this in this net? How'd that Texas Southern 183? They went. They they were easily in the 200s. That was their first win of the season. It's bad. It's real bad. Since 1980. The previous worst record by any team to 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 defeat an AP ranked opponent was 0-3. I saw that. Texas Southern was 0-7. History was made in the O Dome. Not good kind of history, the bad kind of history. 
bad history. We're up against this. This is going to be a short pod. Let me give you a quick heads up on uh, Wednesday and Thursday games. Wednesday night, we got UConn at West Virginia. That's a road game for the Huskies. Their first time at WVU since they both shared an allegiance inside the Big East. Indiana plays Wisconsin. That's a really good one on Wednesday. I'm looking forward to. Minnesota is undefeated and welcoming in the Michigan State Spartans. So a really good Big Ten matchup there. And then we've got a quality Utah State team, which could be headed toward, you know, real interesting bubble territory. We'll see. But if it could win at BYU, it could really do, do itself nicely. So those are four key games on Wednesday. No, Thursday, there's three of them. Purdue, now officially number one for the first time in program history. It will go on the road to play at the rack and will play a Rutgers team, which is as desperate for a good win as almost any power conference team that we expected to be in the NCAA tournament conversation. Rutgers is not there right now. So that'll be Thursday night. Two other ones. Purdue trying to get their first win ever inside an arena named after a Subway sandwich. It's actually Jersey Mike's. <laughs> Very much not a Subway. I think I think Jer- I think a, I think a Jersey Mike is a sub sandwich. It's the same. It's the same. It's a sub sandwich. Well, that's what I said. You said Subway. I did not. Oh, the comments need to need to to judge in real time. Maybe I misheard it. Two other I think, games. I, I think what I said is Purdue trying to get a for, win for the first time in an arena named after a sub sandwich. I'm. I thought. I thought. I thought I heard Subway. Oh, who cares? Who, who cares? cares? Two more. They said the, the the comments are the comments are against me. They say I said Subway sandwich. What do you want from me? This is probably why my wife is always arguing with me when I she says I say something and I say I didn't say that. Yeah. If only the comment the commenters were in my home. You want you want a real time commenting section as you argue with your wife? Don't know about that one. Yeah, I don't think I need that. Iowa State. And I don't argue with my wife. We just sometimes we just sometimes slightly disagree with each other on things. That's correct. Iowa State's at home against Iowa on Thursday night. Iowa State undefeated. Iowa started 7-0, lost against Purdue. And then on Monday night, the other game of no, it played Illinois well, but lost by four. Shouts to Alfonso Plummer. He's been quite an addition for that Illinois team to this point. Uh, Iowa, Iowa State on Thursday is another good one. And then, That's a great one. Great one? It's pretty the Cyclones good. are undefeated with the in-state rival coming in. Good. What's great about this is that it's not on a Friday. I feel like this game has been on a Friday every year for the past decade and a half, and they're finally playing on a Thursday. Way to get it done. People saying Subway left and right in this chat session. But I know. <laughs> I know. I don't even I love it. Uh, last one. Texas is on the road against Seton Hall on Thursday night. Uh, that is uh, very intriguing. Seton Hall could really do itself wonders by getting a win there. Texas needs it more, though. Texas has played one legitimate opponent, and it was not competitive on the road against Gonzaga, so it's going to play on the road again against Seton Hall, and it's... Uh, what about the backstory is to Texas playing at Seton Hall? I am, I'm unfamiliar with what would have led these teams to... Uh, Sounds like something with- that I should read about in the court report. Look at you. Uh, this will not be in the court report, but a quick tease on the court report, which is going up later on Wednesday. Uh, we could have, could have a player or two average more than 15 rebounds in a season for the first time in more than four decades. One of those players is Kentucky's Oscar Shibway, and I talked to him on his uh, on his way back to his apartment last night after Kentucky got the win over over uh, Southern. And so I, that is the lead item in there. The era of the truly dominant rebounder has long been gone in college basketball in terms of averaging 16, 17, 18 a night. But Shibwe, he insists, and he's going to try his best. He wants to average 20 a night. He's not going to get there. But if he can get to 16 or 17, he'll be the first in more than four decades. There's also another player, coached by Mark Madsen, who's also highlighted Fardaz Amak out of Utah Valley. They beat BYU recently. So that'll be the lead item in the court report. And if you're listening live, that'll go up in probably about an hour and a half. If you're listening on Wednesday afternoon, it's already on the website. I don't care what Jerry Palm says. Ooh. You're, you're the one who has said that like five times on this podcast now. So I do care what Jerry Palm says. I do care what Jerry Palm says. That's why I thought we should reference. We should maybe ask the, the bracket expert what he thinks of your two two seed line drop Jerry palms in the middle of predicting who's going to be playing in one of 41 bowls at the moment it's all done everything's settled over there he's about to turn his attention to college basketball and you're over here saying i don't care what he says big 12 big east battle is a thing that's why texas is at seton hall i knew it but i didn't know it the big 12 big east thing is this 
Is this some more Gavit? Is this some more Gavit games? How many more Gavit games we got? <laughs> what do they just call everything the Gavit games? The whole season was the Gavit games. What if, indeed? I think you got to get out of here. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Turner Phipps. Legend. Shouts, by the way, I've had multiple people send me Baylor basketball player databases. I have so many Baylor names now. It's it's like a blessing. It's like a blessing from God. So many Baylor names now. Shouts, shouts to Larnell. You said shouts. <laughs> This is where if we were taping, I'd just say, all right, back that up. Let's start over. Let's start this whole thing over. Charts to Baylor. Charts to learn now. Thank you guys for listening once again to Island College Basketball Podcast. Middle of the dumbest pandemic of my lifetime. Friday at 10 a.m.? Oh, um, Friday at 10 a.m. I'm I'll I'll be uh under anesthesia getting oh yeah removed. that's right oh you got to get out of here but we will have a podcast at some point but we got to figure out when that's going down well it's got to be thursday night or else it's going to be uh the ion college basketball podcast with matt norlander and david cobb that that might actually have to be a thing here no, that, might, that might have to be a thing i'm having teeth removed on uh friday my mouth has been hurting for a solid month i take advil Every day, just to prevent my mouth from hurting, I've got to get teeth removed. But there was, and Friday next week is the first time where I had a few days where I don't have to travel before I go to Las Vegas for the CBS Sports Classics. I'm getting them removed on Friday, and I plan to be addicted to painkillers all weekend. Looking forward to that, by the way. <laughs> Not that there's anything funny about being addicted to painkillers, but if you can do it temporarily, looking forward to that. 48 hours of painkillers. Well, I think we're going to try and do a podcast Thursday night, but I don't know. It's a tough scene. Next, next, tune in live on YouTube. Set the alarm, schedule it, subscribe. Be a little surprise. We'll see how this goes. And in, in Sunday night's episode, I could still be high. You know, you never know. Got you never Bears, know. What got, got the Bears Packer Sunday night, by the way. So we got to squeeze that in before that gets going. This whole thing's getting complicated, you know? This whole thing's getting complicated. I'm pretty sure you need to leave, like, right now so that you catch this plane. Yeah, my Uber is downstairs right now. I scheduled an Uber. Remember when I taught you how to do that? You did. Think about all the things you teach me and then and I, what I teach you. I teach you how to schedule Ubers. I teach you about the Big Bank Challenge. Oh, by the way, shouts to all the listeners. People are actually sending me Big Bank Challenges now. They're like, GP, I found a good one. <laughs> Ah, if you're not subscribed, please go subscribe anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts. If you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel, please do that. Not as said, we're 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 uh, we. Uh, I read in an email we're the fastest to ever get to 1,000 subscribers, and now we want to be the fastest to get to whatever the next milestone is. So help us do that. Go we're closing in on 2,000. We need go, like another couple hundred to get to 2,000. Yeah, get that should there. that should be no problem. Go subscribe to the YouTube channel. While you're there, smash the like button. Like your Brandon Davies. He would. My man sacrificed a basketball season, a possible trip to the Final Four, just to smash. Please go make your flight. If he's going to smash and put his basketball career at risk, what is your excuse? You don't have one. You're not going to get suspended from anything for smashing. So go smash the like button. And we'll talk to you again on Thursday night or either dead leg and David Cobb will be here on Friday morning. At this point, I honestly don't care. <laughs> See you later. <laughs>